Good morning and welcome to East Auburn Baptist Church. Four characteristics of the Christian life, L-I-F-E, love, integrity, faith, and today we're going to hear a message on excellence. Our uh, song this morning is number 549, Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Philippians 3.14 says, we, I press on towards the mark of the prize. I press on. Let's press on this one. Let's stand and sing number 549, Higher Ground. Let me hear you sing out this morning. Here we go. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on Him. I 
says we are redeemed through the blood of Christ. God gave everything for us. He drenches us with his love. Let's remember that. You are matchless in grace and mercy. There is nowhere we can hide from your love. You are steadfast, never failing. You are faithful. All creation is in awe of who you are. You're the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart you our King, our Savior forever, for eternity we will sing of all you've done. For eternity we will sing of all you've done, and we sing, God we healing in your love. You're the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. And we sing, God
one stand between us. God, we love us. God, for us. Nothing come against. No one stand between us. Amen, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let me see. And amen. Thank you, Darren. And team, we thank you for that. Good morning, church. It's good for us to be together. God has been building his, his church all weekend, gatherings all day yesterday, children's ministries and various ministries gathering in the group, in the church here last night, earlier this morning, and now together we come. We welcome all of you. We welcome certainly those that are with us by live stream and each and every week, we're welcoming more of our church back to the fellowship. We certainly want to say to our live stream audience, I should really just look right in the camera and say, we would love to see you back with us and uh, in the fellowship. Yeah, we can clap for that. That's a good thing. So the church is in agreement that we miss you, and it's not the same without you, and uh, there are seats for you in the fellowship. So... Uh, we welcome you. We uh, practice that which the church has practiced from the beginning. And before the, the church, God's people certainly prayed. And so this morning, we follow that tradition and continue that good discipline of prayer. Let's go before our God. In Jesus' name, we come before you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the welcome we have. The Bible says we can come boldly. Because Jesus has provided the way to God the Father. We come because we have need. We come because we want to thank you. I pray, Lord, first of all, that your Holy Spirit would lead us even in this time, help us not in the power of the flesh, but the power of the Spirit to come before your throne. We worship you in song already this morning and have declared our faith and our commitment to following you and moving forward. Lord, we pray for our nation far from you. We pray for our leaders, we pray for our president and other leaders in the nation, Lord, that there would be a recognition of you as their creator, God, the one that has ordained and placed them in the place that they are. Please, God, work in their hearts and work in their minds. We pray for our military around the world. We thank you for them. Especially we pray for those that are from our fellowship. There are many that are out and about around the world. Many in harm's way, we pray for them and lift them up. Thank you for all the men, women that have served, giving us this great freedom and liberty that we are practicing in this very morning. We pray for our missionaries, those that are local and serving Christ right here in the Twin Cities, and many are afar. Provide for them fellowship and friendship when they're separated from friends and family here. Open the door of the gospel for them, Lord. We pray that for them. We pray that for us, Lord, that you give us doors of opportunity to be bright lights in a very dark world. We pray for our fellowship, Lord, um, that, Lord, you will build your church and regather those, Lord, that have not been able to gather with the fellowship. And now they can, and I pray they would, that we would not forsake the gathering, but come together 
participate in the family life, serve and greet, minister, that the body would edify itself in love. Lord, we uh, lift up those that have particular need in our fellowship. For Ray Ames, we think of all the years he was here and greeting, and he's not able to, but we pray your blessing on Ray. For Thelma Bouvet and Len, we lift them up, Lord, as they together go through this difficult time. For Roberta Burgess, Lord, bless treatment, continue to strengthen her body. For Bernadette Hodgkins, Lord, we thank you for her and her faith. Bless her, give her strength, comfort her. For Merlene, Lord, we pray your grace and your mercy. And she's able to be with us. So bless her and help us to love on her and encourage her as she's here today. For Kathy Stang, Terry, and the rest of the family, Lord, we pray your comfort, and wisdom. Continue to pray for Liz and Libby, Lord, and thank you for her many years of diligent service in the office. And I just pray you bless her, grace her body, Lord. We lift up Jason Matthews and Kim, Lord, and say journey with ALS. Meet the needs of the family. For those in grief, the Fontaine family, the Kenneboris family, Lord. Passing of Greg's sister, and we just pray that you would comfort them. We pray for the family of Dorothy Allen, Lord, as we gather tomorrow morning. Comfort them with the word. Thank you for Dorothy's faithfulness and testimony throughout the many years she lived. Lord, bless uh, those that are listening by way of live stream. I pray that, Lord, um, you would meet their needs, that we'd stay in touch with one another, connected. We thank you for those that are here this morning, some in dark places, struggling with depression. We pray that you would bring light through the word and through the worship and through the fellowship. Help none of us to miss out on an opportunity to reach out to one another. You've told us that even our greeting is holy. Help us to be sincere. Help us to not think of only our own interest, but the interest of others. How are they feeling? Where are they, where are they at in their journey of life? How are they spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally? Help us to look at the full person and care for one another. Help us all to be diligent. The Bible says there's to be a diligence in our stewardship of our gifts. Thank you for God's people giving in service and finances. Thank you for their faithfulness to your church. Bless the word today and your servant as he shares it. Fill him afresh and strengthen him and help him to be bold and confident in you and your word, Lord. There's power in the scriptures. We thank you for this time. Pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so thankful that you could join us this weekend. If you are new to East Auburn or are joining us online, please visit eabc.me slash connect so that we can connect with you. Here's what's happening at East Auburn. Ladies, join us on Tuesday, July 27th at 6.30 p.m. for a campfire and delicious desserts as we gather for a night of fellowship and encouragement. Please feel free to bring a dessert to share. The Red Cross Blood Drive is here on Tuesday, July 27th from 1 to 6 p.m. Please sign up at redcrossblood.org. There are still many events happening on a weekly basis at our church. Please check eabc.me to see a detailed list. Thank you so much for your faithful giving. You can give easily online at eabc.me slash give, on your phone using the EABC app, or you can place your offering in the boxes as you leave the service. 
If you'd like prayer, please come to the front of the sanctuary at the end of service where someone will pray with you. Or you can add your request to the prayer chain by emailing prayer at eabc.me. Thanks for joining us this weekend. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service.
Thanks, Jesse. Team, appreciate it. Good morning, church. Week number four of our series on the four characteristics of the Christian life. We talked about love, integrity, and faith, and today we're going to cover excellence. Now, if you actually were to look through the Bible for a spot where Christians are called to excellence, if you're looking for the verse, thou shalt be excellent, you won't find it. Okay? The, now, the Bible does use the word excellent, but in almost every circumstance, it's talking about the word of God or God himself. But there are lots of um, verses that point to how we as Christians are supposed to act, whether our conduct or our speech, uh, the way that we treat others, our motivation behind why we do what we do, our work ethic, how we're supposed to be in the world and not of the world. So we have all these things that point us to a life of excellence. And E fits really well with my life um, acronym. So that's why we went with excellence this morning. I want to read a couple of verses um, to kind of show you uh, where we get this idea, where we pull the idea of excellence and how as Christians we are called to a life of excellence. I'm going to read about five or six verses this morning. If you want to turn to Colossians 3.23, that will be our, our main text um, this morning. So we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. It says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who completes, competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. I love this because what Paul is saying here is running isn't enough. Finishing isn't enough. We're not in this to get our participation trophy, right? Paul says we all run, but only one gets the prize, and we should run in a way that we will be the ones to receive it. Right, so it's the idea of training, doing your best, giving it your all, not just participating, not just running, but um, in such a way that you may obtain the prize. And I love how he, he kind of points to the fact that most who run, they uh, run to obtain a perishable crown, but we run for an imperishable one. Right, sometimes we talked this, this series about a why, right, and we need that why to drive us, and, and we need to understand what is it that motivates us, and our motivation isn't for a trophy on the mantle, Right? It's for an imperishable crown. We have a, a reason that we run, a reason that we train, a reason that we run to obtain it. Right? We are called to do more than participate, more than finish. We're called to run in such a way that we may obtain the prize. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 31, it says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I love how he points to the most mundane things in life. Right? You're eating or drinking. And whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. All of it. Right? So this isn't, doesn't focus on the action, but it focuses on the motivation. It doesn't matter what it is you're doing. Okay? You, you can bring up, what about this? What about this? Paul says, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, we're doing it for the glory of God. Right? And then in Colossians 3.23, it says the same thing. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the importance of fearing God, right? How most of us live a life the way that we do because we fear men, right? But the importance of fearing the Lord. And if we fear the Lord, we work for the Lord. So again, whatever you do, doesn't matter your work, doesn't matter your employer, doesn't matter your job or your position, you don't work for men. As a Christian, you work for the Lord, and you need to see your daily act of work as your daily act of worship. We work as unto the Lord, in Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it says, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Again, here's that thing, in all things. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about you. Right. So what we see here is we should live our lives in such a way that if we have any uh, opponents, when they go to dig up dirt on you, they will be ashamed for trying because there's nothing to find. Can you imagine that? We live in a world and a society when we hear the dirt dug up, we're really not surprised, right? Because everyone has dirt, right? But what we're called to do is live a life that someone can go ahead and try. Look in my closets and under my rugs because I've got nothing to be ashamed of. That idea of integrity, I live a whole life, right? We should live our lives in such a way that if someone tries to dig up dirt on us, they're ashamed and embarrassed because they can't find anything. That's what we're called to do as Christians. 
And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under the basket, but on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, our Father in heaven will be glorified when others see our good works. That's what we're called to do. We are called to glorify God by our good works. Remember this idea of Christian is Christ-like, and, and when we claim this name or when we are given this name Christ, we should try to be like Christ. And Christ spent his life doing everything in his power to glorify his Father in heaven, and we should do the same. And he says that we can do that by our good works. It's this idea of excellence. We are called to excellence. Now, it's important for me that you understand that excellence is not perfection. Turn to your neighbor and say, excellence is not perfection. If you are still taking notes, okay, give yourself a pat on the back all four weeks. You brought your notebook and write down, excellence is not perfection. Okay, we want to make sure that we understand this. Because so many times I feel like we sell ourselves short or because of our imperfection, that is our excuse or our reason not to do what God has called us to do. Oh, God can't use me because of my sin or because of my regret or because of my shame or because of whatever it is. And that's a lie from Satan. Because the honest truth is that God uses you despite your imperfection, and he does so because he gets the glory. Okay, so last week we talked about Hebrews 11. And we looked at all, this men, all of these men and women that did these awesome things for God by their faith. Right, and probably when we re read through that, you couldn't really identify. You're like, man, I haven't seen any of that in my life. God can't use me like that, right? So these, these men and women of the faith. Let's look at who God uses. Okay, if you look at Hebrews 11, these are the list of names that you see. Abel had a sibling rivalry. Noah got drunk. Abraham was old and impatient. Sarah had doubt and was impatient. Isaac had favorites. Jacob was a liar and a cheat. Joseph was prideful. Moses stuttered and was impatient. The Israelites were short-sighted, disobedient, and impatient. Rahab was a prostitute. Gideon was insecure. Barak was nervous. Samson was easily fooled and prideful. Jephthah made hasty promises. And David committed adultery and murder. So last week with this list that you couldn't identify with, we can all identify with something there. Right? And these are the people that God uses. Okay, so excellence is not perfection. God can use you despite your sin. So don't let Satan bench you because you feel guilt and shame for your sin. Right? Now God calls us to a life that live outside of sin. I'm not saying you can remain in your sin. We don't want to live in sin. But don't let your past sin stop your future service. Don't allow God, uh, Satan to tell you that lie. Because it's through Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit that you and I are able to do the work that God has called us to do. It's not by our own might, it's by God's. You have probably heard it said, um, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. You ever heard that? That's a very christian thing to say, right? It makes you feel good. But there's a lot of truth to that. Because if you look at the people, the men and women that God uses, a lot of them, when God said, hey, I want you to do this, their initial reaction was, I can't do that. Right? I think of Moses, right? And he had a good reason, right? Another word for excuse. I can't lead people. I have a stutter, right? And God says, That's, I can work around that. Right? It doesn't matter what it is that you think is holding you back from doing God's will. If he's calling you to do something, he'll make sure that you are able to complete it. Right? We need to remember that we represent Jesus. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, the Bible says that now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So in all of, the, all of chapter 5, or the, before this in chapter 5, Paul is ta talking to the Corinthians about being reconciled. He's like, I've been reconciled, I've been reunited, I've been brought back into relationship with Jesus you have been reconciled to Jesus, and now you are ambassadors for Christ to tell others this story so that they can be reconciled for Jesus. Right? So it's this idea of you have a mission, you have a goal, and the goal is to tell others what you have experienced and how they can experience the same thing. Okay? And I love the word ambassadors that he uses because it paints such an awesome picture of, of what we're called to do. 
right? As, as ambassadors, uh, we have to understand what an ambassador does. An ambassador is one that represents a country or a nation, right? They know what they represent, and they represent um, the good. And a lot of times, um, the, the, the person that they're interacting with, the country that they're representing, this is the only interaction with that country they'll ever have. And you and I need to remember that. Because for many of us, when you interact with people, you might be the only Bible that someone ever reads. You might be the only church experience that someone ever has. You might be the only Jesus interaction in somebody's life as an ambassador for Christ. So how you doing? Right? There's a lot of weight to that. We need to remember that as Christians, that's what we're called to do. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. We're not representing ourselves. Right? We need to get out of the way. If, if I come up here this morning and I give you Craig Fortin, there's nothing, there's not a lot there. Okay? We don't represent ourselves, and sometimes we have to get over ourselves. Right? We talked week one about our, our ability to love is directly tied to our ability to humble ourselves. Right? We need to get out of the way, because if we're going to represent Christ, it's Christ that needs to be shown up, not us. Right? The Bible says that we have to die daily, and how, how better Christ than I, and how we have to get out of our way, and putting on all the armor of God, and how every piece of the armor is Jesus. Okay? We're no longer representing ourselves. Okay? It's not your pride. You have to get out of the way and represent Christ. Because when an ambassador comes and represents their country, their name doesn't matter. It's where they come from, their country that matters. Right? And the same thing as we are ambassadors. An ambassador makes it known who they represent. There's no question. Right? They speak the language. They wear the colors. They know the history. There's no question who they are representing. And it's the same with you and I. Right, we talked about the idea at the beginning of the series how sometimes when we claim the name Christian to people, they might be surprised to know that you go to church. And that shouldn't be the case. There should be no question who it is that you represent. We live in a day and age where even in church we kind of feel weird talking about Jesus. How sad is that? We should be bold in our faith and not worried about well, what comes because of who we represent. If we represent Jesus, we are bold about talking about him because there's nothing better to talk about. I was, I was this way, and now I'm this way, and it's because of him. That is an amazing thing. We are called to share our testimony. You know, I think a lot of us, the reason we fall short in representing Christ is because we think we have to know all the answers. We think we have to know, you know, all the theology. We have to know um, all of the difficult things, and we have to be able to support everything. That's not what God's called you to do. He's called you to share your story. And guess what? You are the expert on your story. Nobody knows your story like you do. Nobody knows it. Okay? So when God calls you to share your story, the thing is that people need to know that Jesus heals broken hearts. People need to know that he softens hardened hearts and that he changes evil hearts. And you and I need to be a living demonstration of that. So many times we think that if we are supposed to represent Christ, we're supposed to be this thing, we're supposed to keep the rules, we're supposed to be a certain way, we're supposed to have it all together, and what that does is it kind of closes us off and it makes us cold and rigid, right? And that's not what God's calling us to do. As an ambassador, we should show, Paul talks all the time, I was this way, but now I'm this way, and because of Christ's gifts, of Christ's work within me, and we need to be vulnerable and share our difficulties and our failings and show how Christ is the answer. Right? People need to, sh to see that, cr that God still changes lives. The cool thing about an ambassador, too, is an ambassador doesn't work with just his or her own resources. Okay? They have the resources of their country or their nation supporting them. And when you and I are ambassadors for Christ, you're not working on your own. You're not loving from your own um, ability to love. You're not filled with your own joy, right? You have the resources of God Almighty at your disposal. Okay, so when you love others, we love others with the love of Christ. We're filled with joy from Christ. Every single day, you and I need to be filling up, attached, abiding in Christ so that we can be tapped into his resources and share Christ with others, right? We have um, resources at our disposal as ambassadors for Christ. It's not our power, but the power of the Holy Spirit. Gregory Kukul writes a lot about uh, being ambassador in his book, Tactics. And he says uh, this. He says that our character can make or break our mission. 
Knowledge and wisdom are packaged in a person, so to speak. If that person does not embody the virtues of the kingdom he serves, he will undermine his message and handicap his efforts. You know, Roger talks all the time the importance of not only giving the gospel, but also living the gospel, right? We can't tell people about the love of Christ that has changed us when we aren't loving, right? Our actions, our character need to support our message. And if it doesn't, then we are undermining our own mission. And we're handicapped by our, by our own character. As an ambassador, we are called to represent Christ in the way that we act, the way that we think, the way that we speak, right? In the way that we live. In his book, he gives 10 qualities of an ambassador. I want to read through them with you this morning. They'll be on the screen. First of all, an ambassador is ready. An ambassador is alert for chances to represent Christ and will not back away from a challenge or an opportunity. This idea of an ambassador. Remember, we are always an ambassador. We're ready. Now, it doesn't mean we have to know it all, like we talked about, right? You are a professional or an expert on your story. And be ready to talk about it, right? Be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you. Always ready, always excited to talk about Jesus. An ambassador is also patient. An ambassador won't quarrel, but will listen in order to understand. Then with gentleness will seek to respectfully engage those who disagree. Okay, the goal here is not to win the Facebook argument. Okay, that's not what we're looking to do here. That doesn't work. Okay, and I don't think anyone's mind has ever been changed because of a Facebook argument, ever. Right, so that's not the goal. We're not being to be quarrelsome, right? We're supposed to be patient. We listen Okay? We want to make sure we understand their perspectives so that we can better reach them. Okay? An ambassador is patient. An ambassador is reasonable. An ambassador has informed convictions, not just feelings. We give reasons, we ask questions, and we aggressively seek answers. We will not be stumped by the same challenge twice. Right? So uh, this idea of being reasonable is mean we have reason behind what we are talking about. This is not just a feeling or emotion. I know without a shadow of a doubt the healing power of the Holy Spirit because of my experience with it, right? And because of what I've read in the Bible, what I've seen in the lives of others, right? It's just conviction. It's not just this feel-good emotion, okay? And so we are able to really stand firmly. And when we, when we um, encounter a challenge that we don't know the answer to, we're going to go seek the, the, the answer to it. That way, next time, if we ever come to that challenge again, we have the answer, Right? Doesn't mean you have all the answers all the time. An ambassador is tactical. An ambassador adapts to each unique person and situation, maneuvering with wisdom to challenge bad thinking, presenting the truth in an understandable and compelling way. You see, the thing is, sometimes we think that we just have to have these cookie cutter answers, and I think that turns people off to the gospel. Right? You and I are completely different people. I hope that your relationship with Christ is much different than mine because we're different. God's created and made you different than he's created and made me. Praise God, okay? So your relationship with God should look different, just like every marriage looks different. So anytime that you talk about Christ or have an interaction with someone about Christ, it should be different. It should ma match what they're going through. Now, we're not changing our message, but we're changing maybe the way that we deliver it so that we can be um, better uh, ta tactical about the way that we share things. So it would be more approachable, okay? Uh, ambassador is tactical. Also, an ambassador is clear. An ambassador is careful with language, will not rely on Christian lingo or gain unfair advantage by resorting to empty rhetoric. An ambassador is clear, right? So there are so many things. You grew up in church, right? You know the answers, right? If someone asks you a question, you know what to say. But then when you're challenged on it, what does that mean? Nothing. That's my favorite question to ask when I'm teaching students. Is I'll ask a question and they'll say the Christianese right thing. is okay, what does that mean for you? I don't know. You know, we want to be clear as Christians. We don't want to say this, this fuzzy thing that makes you feel good but have no idea what it means. Right? We want to make sure that we are clear and there's no confusion. There's, there's no in, room for interpretation. Right? This is what I'm talking about. And that's what an ambassador does. An ambassador is clear. An ambassador is also fair. An ambassador is sympathetic and understanding towards others and will acknowledge the merits of contrary views. You know, a few weeks ago we talked about the compassion of Jesus. Well, since then I've done more of a study on the compassion of Jesus. And one thing that uh, we, we've talked about is how um, 
Jesus had compassion on people because he had knowledge about the situation. You know, so many of us, we can breeze by people in need, and because we don't fully understand what they go through, we don't have a lot of compassion on them. Or maybe there's that person at work that just rubs you the wrong way. They just drive you nuts. You talk about 40 grit sandpaper, you know, you just can't stand it. And you have no compassion for what they say or what they do because you don't put yourself in their position. And if we try to understand where people come from, we try to understand why people think the way that they think, first of all, we'd be a whole lot more approachable to them, right? And you'd have more compassion on them. So an ambassador is fair. He listens. He responds. He takes time to hear where they're coming from so that he can better respond. An ambassador is also honest. An ambassador is careful with the facts and will not misrepresent another's view, overstate his own case, or understate the demands of the gospel. I believe that this is so key. I think the problem with so many of us is we're not clear and we're not honest. We say things that feel good and we give a watered down truth to not offend. And what happens is people that we encounter, they leave feeling good about how they already are. And they're not changed. Because the gospel changes lives. And if we aren't clear and we aren't honest about the gospel, then we are misrepresenting Christ. And the whole point of being an ambassador is so that others will be reconciled. If someone is walking away from your encounter with you and they feel good about their sin, they are not reconciled to Christ. And you completely miss the point. We need to be honest. We need to be clear. And honesty is also this this part of us that struggles with saying, I don't know. It's important to learn that phrase. Because the truth is, you don't have all the answers. And if you wait until you have all the answers, you'll never do anything. So when someone encounters you and they bring up a challenge that you don't know the answer to, it's much better to say, I don't know, than trying to come up with something. Okay, I've come up with something so many times. When a student comes and says, hey, Craig, what about this? I'd like to sound smart and like I'm, I'm supposed to do what I'm, what I'm here for, right? So I give a, an answer. And guess what normally happens? I get a call from the parents. Or the next week I have to apologize, say I was way off on that one. Right? It's much better to say, you know what, I don't know, I'll look into that and get back to you. Right? Because we want to give them truth. We don't want to give them, give them your version of the gospel. We want to give them the gospel. An ambassador is humble. An ambassador is also attractive. An ambassador will act with grace, kindness, and good manners. We will not dishonor Christ in his conduct. Right? A lot of times, we miss out on interactions with people just because of the kind of personality we have or the kind of reputation we've allowed ourselves to build up. If people don't want to talk to you because you're a jerk, you're not going to be a very good ambassador for Christ. Right? We want to be the kind of person that that is likable, someone that is filled with grace and kindness and good manners. Right? We're not backing down from our message, but we can still be approachable. You, uh, You probably have encountered people in your life that you disagree with, but you still like hanging out with them. Right? We can do that as ambassadors for Christ. And lastly, an ambassador is dependent. An ambassador knows the effectiveness uh, requires joining his best efforts with God's power. Right? It's not just me. I'm attaching my best efforts with the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm dependent on God in order to do the mission that he's called us to do. An ambassador for Christ, you're going to find yourself doing the right thing instead of the wrong things. You find yourself doing the right things, uh, the right, things the right way instead of halfway or haphazardly. You believe right, you speak right, you act right, and then things turn out right. It's funny how it works that way. As an ambassador, we we should be in the habit of doing our best, right? We're not trying to earn God's love because that's already cared for, right? But we want to see God work, others, we want others to see God working through us by our actions. We should be leaving the world a better place than you found it. 2 Corinthians 3.6 says, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We are sufficient ministers. The Spirit of the law, we give life. We should be leaving the world a better place than we found it. People should be better off for knowing you. In Proverbs thirteen seventeen, it says, A faithful ambassador brings health. You are leaving behind a legacy. If you're an ambassador for Christ, you are leaving behind a legacy of changed lives. 
through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit who works within you. We need to be doing our best work for God. You may say, whew, that's a lot. You're right, it is. It's a lot to ask. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of weight. I always have to be on all the time, never get a break, never let my hair down, never relax, never. No, this is what God's calling us to do. You are an ambassador for Christ. But I love Paul's encouragement in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. He says, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Right? He says, don't grow weary. Don't grow weary of doing good. You're going to reap. He says, in due season. I love that because it's, it's a reminder to me that life is seasonal. Right? Ecclesiastes 3, one says that for everything there is a season. And it's a, that's a healthy reminder for me. It's a healthy reminder. Sometimes when life just gets busy and hard and I feel like uh, because I'm focused so much on this thing, I'm not able to do my best in these other areas. Right? That's, that's life. And it's a good and healthy reminder to, to remember that life is seasonal. And sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to be imperfect because excellence is not perfection. Okay? And we know that God can work with imperfect because he uses imperfect people and their imperfect work to complete his perfect will. So we, you and I need to give ourselves permission to be imperfect, knowing that we're in a season right now. I have to focus on this right now. Okay? It's not this idea of, oh, that's good enough. Right? I uh, um, used to, in my flesh, have that attitude, the good enough. The C's get degrees. I actually got a text from a parent the other day. What's this you telling my kid? Thanks, Addy. Appreciate that. <laughs> What's this you telling my kid? C's get degrees. You know, that, that's not glorifying to God, that good enough attitude. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? It's this idea of, you know what, that's the best I can do right now because I have something greater. It's a season. I would encourage you when you make decisions on how you spend your time, you don't, you don't want to decide things based on what's urgent or based on what you think is important, but try to think about what is significant, right? In this season of my life, what is significant? What can I do today that will matter tomorrow, right? And when we're called to be ambassadors for Christ, that's the focus. We need to remember that life is seasonal. But you see, there's two sides to that coin, Right? You have the people that want to do and be all things to all people and do 100% all the time. But then we have the other side to the life is seasonal. Right? Maybe you have found yourself living in a season for a long time. Maybe you've entered a season of difficulty or regret or healing or pain or recovery or rest. And you've been in that season for a long time. You've allowed yourself to stay and to remain stagnant in that season. And you need to remember that life is seasonal. Go through that season. Life will bring those things. Don't ignore them. Go through them. Give it the time that it's due, but then move on. We want to, to remember not to remain, right? We had a season of having to do church online. That season is over. We need to get back here again. You've maybe had a season of coming to church and sitting and being filled and leaving, for many of you, that's the season that you're in, and we welcome you here, and we hope that you find the healing that you're looking for. But for many of you, that's been the season you've been sitting in for years and years and years, and that is not okay. Going through the season is okay, but remember, we don't want to remain. We want to continue. We want to be an ambassador for Christ, representing him in all things that we do and in all seasons of life. So there you go. Four characteristics of the Christian life. Love. We need to lead with love. Having compassion and allowing our compassion to move us. When we see something, we need to do something about it. We need to remember that love is completely and directly attached to our humility. Integrity. Not living a segmented life, but a whole life, a complete life. Integrity is important to God, so it should be important to us. It offers a life of peace and a life of simplicity. And if you have integrity... Nothing else matters. But if you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. Faith is the substance of hope and the evidence of invisible change. It's only helpful when we act upon it. It's necessary not only to be a Christian, but also as a Christian. And if we lose our faith, we need to reach, remember, and resume. 
and excellence. As a Christian, we are called to live a life of excellence. We, we bring glory to God by our good works. We are to represent Christ at all times and in all seasons. We're not expected to be perfect, but we're supposed to do our best and rely on Christ. So, Christian, are you living the Christian life? Or are you falsely claiming the title? The good news is not too late. Because God's mercy and forgiveness and grace are new every morning. So let's not allow our faith to be dead. But let's show our faith by our works that we may glorify our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that works within us. Lord, I pray that you help us to live a life of excellence. Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to represent you and not ourselves. Lord, lead us and guide us as we go from here. In your name we pray. Amen. The altars are open. You're dismissed. Thank you.